uh, you guys will have to forgive me at the uh, the top of the show. I am battling a really bad cold, so I sound really bad. Um, it's not that beautiful, sexy voice that you're used to that with that southern drawl. So I apologize for. Uh, at least you look great. Oh well, thank you, sir. Um, I, I tell you, I am in, I'm extremely intimidated tonight because the amount of just academic expertise and intelligence and knowledge in this call is enough to make me want to like crawl under the covers. I feel like a, um, a mentally inferior um, dude over here. So this is going to be awesome. Uh, welcome everybody back to non sequitur. Um, Steve, how's everybody? How are you doing? I'm, I'm having a great hair day. That's all I can say. <laughs> I'm having a great hair day. Wow. I'm, I'm intimidated as well. So I'm kind of, Still in awe that we managed to get uh, uh, Dr. Prothero in here. So I, I'm working That's out the, uh, the, 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 the awe, shock and awe. Um, we are, of course, as you can tell, joined by, um, in his human form tonight, the one and only Paul Gia. How are you doing, Paul? I'm doing well. Thank you so much. Looking forward to my Christmas, which is next week. So no spoilers. Oh, that's right. That's right. You haven't uh, so no no it's spoilers. Not everyone. It's, it's not a Canadian thing. It's just my family. No worries. I was getting ready. It's to a ask. Jewish thing, right? Happy Hanukkah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. All right. So How's let me um, let me let me now. Uh, I'm going to. I very rarely do this, but I feel like it's it's appropriate for uh, for this guest. Um, his his resume is is extremely impressive, and um, I want to read. Some of his um, his accolades here, just so that you guys know, um, Donald Prothero is the author of 35 books, including the best-selling Evolution, What the Fossils Say and Why It Matters, which won the Outstanding Earth Science Book of 2007 Award from the American Association of Publishers. His book, Reality Check, How Science Deniers Threaten Our Future, won the Silver Medal in Science from the Indie Fab Awards, small, which are small and independent publishers. His book, The... Uh, the Eocene, uh, oh man. Oligocene. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Transition. <laughs> Paradise Lost was uh, designated the Outstanding Earth Science Book of 1994 by choice. Other popular titles include Abominable Snowman, the uh, Abominable Science, The Origin of the Yeti, Nessie, and other uh, cryptids. Um, and the, the, I, there's probably. Uh, eight more different books that are that are listed um, on here, but he's also the the author editor. Let me move my thing here, and co editor of numerous technical volumes, including uh, the evolution of um, one more time, Doctor Prothero. Uh, there's both. Um, there's the evolution of artiodactyls and evolution of prissodactyls. I don't know which one you mean. That one, the the <laughs> okay prissodactyls. Yeah, that one. Uh, oh, that so, one. Yeah. So so. Uh, this guy is to say he knows his stuff would be an understatement, and um, it's really cool that he has taken the time to uh, come in and, and be with us. So, uh, welcome, Dr. Prothero. It's great to have you. Oh, thank you for having me. My name is Prothero, by the way, just so we get that straight. Prothero, thank you very much. I, you know, yeah. I, it, I, 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 it, at least once a show, I always screw up someone's last name. That's a that's a he, thing. Here. You know, he so, didn't uh, get my uh, name right for the first three months. He actually forgot it before, so. I forgot it once. It's a work in progress. I've lived, a, I've lived with that all my life. Even my graduate advisor never got it right. Uh, it's it's actually an unusual name. It's a Welsh name. I guess it comes from Ahrida. I mean, son of Roderick in Welsh. So you won't oh, run nice. into very many places. Although if you read Welsh literature, like D Dylan Thomas's A Child's Christmas in Wales, there's a Miss Prothero in there. So it's actually a common name in South Wales. Well, I, I can say this. Um, it, like I said, it happens once every show. I mispronounce someone's last name. So, if anything, I'm consistent. So, um, that, okay. that, there's a good takeaway there. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, I'm gonna uh, I'm I'm gonna now let you guys introduce. Uh, you know, add anything that, that you want, Paul. I know if you got anything on your series coming up, um, what you're doing now. Just kind of tell people if they're not familiar with you for whatever reason where they can find you and um, what you do. Sure. So, um, I'm Paul from Paulagia. Uh, which is a YouTube channel here. I talk, uh, I'm a former Christian, and I talk about a lot of Christian-themed things. Uh, I recently wrapped a series, it took all year, uh, on Eric Hoven's uh, Genesis Paradise Lost movie, uh, take going through minute by minute and kind of uh, letting people know why the science wasn't really science. Um, although this upcoming year, I'm moving more into 
what is my personal expertise, which was uh, the Bible. So I'm going to be doing a little bit of a, obviously I'm still Tara Ken Ham and Eric, um, but uh, I'm going to be also looking at some Bible stuff. So uh, apologia if you're, if you're for some reason, you don't know who I am. That's, that's fun. Excellent. If you want to pronounce, and, mispronounce his name, call him Paul, Pelosia because he really likes that. <laughs> well, that's an acceptable <laughs> Greek form too. I'm, I'm okay. Steve, um, real quickly, uh, before we dive into uh, tonight's topic, I'm going to let you uh, let everybody know about um, that special thing that we've got coming up with. Uh, Apologia reminded me with with Eric about um, Eric's father. Can you let them know? Oh, if, if they weren't here the other night to hear it. Yeah. What is Paul, does yeah. Apologia know? I don't know. Oh, know. maybe. Um, we are arranging for <clears throat> Mr. Uh, Ken Hoven, I don't remember his actual ID number, prison ID number, but Ken Hoven to come in with uh, the guy that started freekenhoven.com when he was in prison trying to get him released. Oh, yeah, Those yeah. Two guys are, what's his name? Mark, Brian, something like that? Wasn't it, wasn't it Ernie something? I honestly don't remember. Anyway. But anyways, uh, he'll be coming in with him to have a debate with negation of P and maybe Nate Brody on the subject of, race for it, tax evasion. Ooh. Yes, tax evasion. So he is going to actually, I guess, talk about whether you know what he did was structuring. Was it against the law? What I what I gathered was he's trying to basically have the governor pardon him by saying that um, what he did wasn't actually a crime. So he's well, trying he's to get exposure. Got a, he has a presidential pardon petition going on right now, but I don't think he That's understands right. that that comes with an admission of guilt. So yeah. uh, that would be interesting to ask. <laughs> This is true. Ooh, ooh, that's a hell of a. Um, all right. Um, so uh, I'm going to turn, uh, Doctor, if you will take this opportunity to uh, kind of go into more detail than than I did with your introduction. You can you know, let people know um, what you're up to these days and um, and and what you do, and then we'll jump into tonight's um, discussion. Sure. Um, I'm actually primarily a paleontologist by training. Um, I was one of those kids who got hooked on dinosaurs at age four and never grew up, except that I got that uh, bug for dinosaurs back in the 1950s, but I was the only kid I ever met in my school years who cared about dinosaurs. Now all kids care about it, including my youngest as well. So it's funny how that's changed, but uh, that's got me started in paleontology, and that was something I pursued all my a academic career and uh, ended up getting my bachelor's in geology and biology to cover all the background of paleo when I was undergrad at UC Riverside. And then my all my graduate degrees at Columbia University and the American Museum of Natural History in New York, uh, which was probably the best place to be trained in fossil uh, vertebrates especially. And so that's my academic background. I have taught a number of places for 27 years. I taught at Occidental College here in Los Angeles, and then I retired from that job early. Uh, but I've also taught at Caltech part-time, uh, and I've taught at other places like Vassar College when I was still a graduate student, and Knox College, Illinois, my first job out of graduate school. And nowadays, I'm mostly semi-retired, trying to write more than anything else, but I still find myself having to earn a few bucks now and then by part-time teaching. So I currently uh, do that at Cal Poly Pomona, uh, which is uh, close to here. And so that's my current position, but I'm hoping to finally stop teaching and fully retire, so all I do is write. Uh, as you mentioned, I've written a number of books. The total is up to 40 now, and there's three more coming out next year, uh, which is oh, not that far away now. Um, and uh, I'm currently working on one. As a matter of fact, I was writing a chapter today about flat earthers. Uh, so it's all about the weird ideas about the earth. Uh, some of them are like flat earthers and geocentrists and hollow earthers and, and uh, you know, the whole spectrum of strange ideas that are out there. And so I've written about half of it already. And I was supposed to finish it by New Year's Day, but I'll probably get it done about a week or two afterwards. So I'm pushing hard to finish it before I go back to teaching in January. You know what's Go ahead. It's amazing. We we host flat earth debates here every weekend. Um where I we noticed that I looked people. at your site, so you had some of those. Yeah. So um you actually engaged the real people. Uh, <laughs> let me ask you let me I'm ask not you a question. Sure they're real people. Before, <laughs> before we get into no, the, the actual Russian, uh, probably. You know, the, the serious science stuff, what's your take on the, the people that think that the earth is because we have we actually have about six people in the live chat right now that um are are flat earthers trying to um spread their message but what's what's your kind of takeaway um that in in your experience or anything that you've seen what, what's what's your take on 
on that? Well, what I've noticed is that the, the weird earthers, you know, the ones who believe in some unconventional idea or another, they're usually of one or two camps. Either they're, they're fundamentalist Christians, and that's where they take the Bible literally, and therefore things like not just young earth creationism, but also things like you know, the sun moves around the earth, and the earth is flat, and all those things are actually in the Bible in the literal form. So those are where a lot of that belief comes from, is an attempt to, to uh, go, go back to biblical literalism. They see that group a lot. But the other groups, uh, especially things like the people who follow Atlantis and hollow earth ideas and all the rest, don't seem to have any religious motive at all. They're mostly in the paranormal crowd. They're people who also buy into stuff like UFOs and aliens, and they tend not to be in the religious side of it at all. So really, it's two different kinds of people who buy into these bizarre ideas, uh, and it all comes from a difference in what their backgrounds are like. Uh, they almost sort into two different camps that only barely overlap. There's some that have both components, so they're religious and they're believers in paranormal, but not very many of them, and they're usually the one or the other. Do you, do you believe them? Do you, do you think that they honestly actually believe this stuff, or is it just like what I think? Oh, yeah. You, you do? Okay. Uh, I, I mean, the ones are religious, certainly, because religion is very central to their lives, and everything else rotates around it. So if you're going to hell, if you don't believe, then you believe, right? That's pretty much the fundamentalism in a nutshell. And uh, so these people who take the Bible literally and say the earth must be the center of the universe because the Bible says so, or, you know, the earth is flat because the Bible says so, all of these people tend to be, therefore, you know, willing to do anything it takes to, to reconcile what's been said with what they believe. Uh, and then I, and a lot of people I've dealt with, when I have dealt with these people, especially when I wrote the book about UFOs and aliens, uh, the people who believe in paranormal, it's almost like a religion to them, too. Uh, they, it's very much a part of their identity to believe in these paranormal topics and, and to, to see the world through that particular set of glasses. And so, you know, they, I, I don't, if I once in a while you run into people I think who are con artists uh, who are selling it. To, to, and a lot of the uh, fundamentalist preachers, I think, often are as much con artists as anything else. They know how to, to get more out of people by you know, milking them for money and donations and all the rest. Ken Ham, I think, falls in that camp, although I'm sure he believes what he preaches. He's also a good uh, you know, salesman as well. But, uh, but, but the majority of them are just true believers, just true believers with a really bizarre point of view. Um, the last thing that I'll, I'll say about the, this is that um, there's because I want to get your take. Um, there's there was an, uh, a journal. I can't remember uh, what journal it was from, but um, somebody did a, a study and they said that there was a correlation between religion in today's society declining and the rise and increase in um, pseudoscience things like the beliefs like this, like the flat yeah. Earth, anti-vax, um, so that. There's a correlation as as people's religiosity goes down, their need to want to you know find something to re replace that. Um, yeah. Do you think that's dealing with evolution? Do you think that's a, a an evolution thing that that has just kind of went with us that need to want to think that there's something else um, out there? Is that rooted like deep within well, us? Well, yeah. You, species, or? you you could talk, talk to a lot of psychologists and anthropologists argue that if you look across human cultures. There always seems to be a need for mysterious things and for greater mysteries and unexplained things that we seem to want that no matter how much science explains the world to us. We still want something that science doesn't explain. And um, it, it, there is some element of that, as you say, that uh, certainly 150 years ago or 100 years ago even, uh, the culture was very strongly religious. But you notice as uh, – for example, the, 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 uh, when I wrote a book about UFOs and aliens, the real explosion of UFOs and aliens begins around the beginning of the 20th century, about the same time science fiction and science fantasy takes off and gradually begins to replace a lot of other things in the most obvious way it does, that you never see any reports of UFOs or aliens in the 19th century. It all happens at the very end of the 19th century or the 20th century or later as the culture shifts to the science fiction literature that creates this meme they all uh, glom onto. And if you saw something in the sky, say, in 1850 or earlier, you wouldn't call it a UFO. You'd call it an angel. And so, you know, a lot of these things people see that they don't understand in the sky, you know, they're very quickly uh, explained by whatever the prevailing cultural meme was, which was right up until the early part of the 20th century, was always a religious icon of some kind. And then when religion sort of started to fade and science fiction took a lot of the mystery on itself, now everything people see they don't understand the sky is UFO. 
And so that that's very strongly tells me that UFOs and angels both are cultural phenomena, not real things. <laughs> and, and, and you also noted that uh, there was a distinct correlation between evolution deniers and climate change as well. Yeah, that comes from a different uh, perspective, and that is that, that once you get into one of these camps that buys very strongly into a particular set of viewpoints, and so, for example, the fundamentalist groups have all locked in very hard on denying evolution, uh, anything else that threatens their purview, and climate change does because it doesn't give them you know, a view of the earth that's favorable the way they think about it, that therefore also has to be a great lie of Satan. And so they often uh, combine the two things. And of course, it's very hard to tease that away from the fact they're all tied into the, real, the political bubble as well, the Fox News, you know, lie, uh, liosphere or whatever. Uh, you, you get this continuous uh, right-wing bubble where these people only hear media that Fox News uh, promotes and don't hear the other side of the story ever. And so there's very little for them to ever uh, doubt. So once, once I don't think they have a strong personal opinion about climate change, but what they do find themselves doing is because their flock agrees with this idea that climate change is a hoax, therefore they all, grew, all follow like sheep. And so there really isn't any thought given to it. They just do whatever the leader of the group tells them to do. Living in Canada, Texas, um, it seems to me like uh, it also corresponds that the most religious states and provinces are also the oil producing ones. And there seems to be some, some happy accidents there. Uh, that's more <laughs> likely accident. It just happens that the great petroleum bases, the U.S., are in these big open rural states, Texas and the Rocky Mountains primarily, and Alaska, of course. And the big open rural states also tend now to have gravitated to one extreme of our political perspective because almost all the rural population now is very much uh, uniformly Republican and the rest of the population has moved to big cities and become uh, Democrat. It's really, that's the greatest polarization we have right now in politics in this country, rural versus urban. Mm -hmm. That's true. Okay, so uh, Paul, I'm going to hand it over to you now and we'll go sure. into uh, the direction of um, some science stuff. So, so yeah, so thank you so much for being here, I, and I love the opportunity to talk to you. I, uh, as we mentioned briefly before the show, uh, I was very recently a young Earth creationist, which you briefly mentioned. Um, so I remember being in that camp. Uh, so, but it also means I'm on this great catch-up in my adult life of uh, having to, you know, get to where where I should have been all along. So, uh, apologies if some of these things are basic. Though I think maybe some of the audience along with me maybe not. Doesn't know all this. One of the things uh, I was really yeah, I always say about most was, Americans generally don't know this stuff. You know, it's <laughs> not just the religious ones. The average high school student doesn't learn much either. So, so if Go you ahead. don't mind starting, I'd love to start with uh, birds. Uh, obviously, I think a lot of like a lot of people, my first discovery that birds might be related to dinosaurs was uh, throwaway lines in Jurassic Park, um, <laughs> and then. But so, I wonder if you could just. Before I have some of the specific questions, could you lay out kind of the case? What's the what's the best evidence? What's the what makes a scientist think that a T. Rex and a chicken are related? Like, what's the what's the basic evidence there that would point to that conclusion? It comes from a tremendous amount of anatomy that you find in these very very primitive birds, uh, Archaeopteryx being one now of hundreds of different that have been found. And the most uh, closely related dinosaurs, things like what called, what's called Velociraptor in the movies, even though it's really Deinonychus, uh, they have a stream high number of anatomical similarities, not just in the bones, which we have preserved pretty well, but quite a few of these specimens, especially those that are preserved from the lower Cretaceous Liaoning province of China, have everything else preserved. They have the feathers, they have the stomach contents, they, they often have even things like uh, uh, color pigments preserved on them so we actually know what color their feathers were and so we have a whole slew not just of early birds that are very dinosaur-like but quite a few dinosaurs that are very bird-like but no one ever called them a bird and it's becoming more and more clear that just about the entire dinosauria almost all the dinosaurs at least the smaller ones had feathers it's a universal feature now found in dinosaurs. And there was just a report last week claiming that the fibers that are found on the bodies of pterosaurs, which are not dinosaurs but are related to them, are probably feathers as well. So it may turn out feathers go all the way back to the branch that separates t uh, pterodactyls from dinosaurs. In either case, feathers are a universal dinosaurian feature, and it's only the larger body ones probably that lost feathers, but they might have had them as juveniles when they were smaller bodied. So feathers is just one piece of the puzzle. Uh, for example, um, if you look at the wrist of a bird, 
it can only move in a, a plane, you know, of up and down motion, a grabbing motion, uh, forward and down. Uh, and that's the way it's supposed to work, although the movie's Deinonychus has its hands moving like this, which is not possible. Dinosaurs only held their hands like this. Uh, and uh, th that motion is a grabbing motion for an animal like Velociraptor or Deinonychus. It's also the same motion as their wrist snaps that you find in the downstroke of a bird. And it's because they have a unique bone right here in their wrist. It's shaped like a half moon. It's a, a fusion of a bunch of the bones of the wrist into one half moon shaped thing. It gives that wrist that, that ankle, that joint that, that flexes like that. Uh, another thing you find that's dinosaurian all the way to the core, uh, next time you have your th uh, Christmas or Thanksgiving turkey or go to get a, a bucket of chicken legs uh, from the colonel or wherever, uh, when you take out the drumstick, you'll always notice that the very bottom of the drumstick where you hand, hold on to it and there's no uh, meat to be eaten, there's a little cap of cartilage there. And if you look at an adult bird, they have that as well. Well, usually it fuses to the end of that bone, which is the same as your shin bone. And that cap of cartilage is a unique joint that's found only in dinosaurs and pterodactyls. It's called the mesotarsal joint. And so dinosaurs and pterodactyls have their the, the ankle hinges not between the, the ankle bones themselves, but between the first row of ankle bones and the second row of ankle bones. The first row of ankle bones is fused to the back and bottom of the shin bone and does not move anymore. And so then they have a hinge in their ankle that's unique. And only birds, dinosaurs, and pterosaurs have that unique feature. Uh, a whole slew of other unique anatomical characteristics. Next time you have a carcass, from, like I did at Christmas time, a carcass of a turkey in front of you, you can find about seven or eight dinosaur features just there in the bones of a turkey. Uh, and so it's very, very, it was, it was apparent back in the 1860s when the first Archaeopteryx was found, and people like Thomas Henry Huxley pointed out it's extremely dinosaur-like, uh, but it's only just gotten to be stronger and stronger case in the last 50 years or so ever since they found things like Deinonychus and Velociraptor. So Amazing. I know some would, you mentioned Archaeopteryx. Um, a lot of, I would have probably just said, well, Archaeopteryx is just a bird. Uh, yeah. And I've also, of course, heard people say, well, it's just a lizard. Um, what about Archaeopteryx tells us that it was uh, both things? Well, because it has a lot of dinosaurian features you will never find in any living bird. Uh, so that stretches most people's definitions of birds beyond the breaking point. Uh, Archaeopteryx, for example, as I mentioned, has a uh, dinosaurian wrist, a dinosaurian ankle, uh, which, of course, all birds have, but it's not found outside of certain groups of dinosaurs it's beyond birds. And uh, it also has things like, for example, the tail is composed, composed of a whole string of bones, like a dinosaur's tail, even though it had feathers on top of it, uh, which no bird today has. All living birds have got all their tailbone fused into that little tiny thing in the back of their pelvis called the Parsons nose in common terms, or the Eurostyle and Eurotagium in, in former terms. And that's unique to birds, but it comes from a tail like a dinosaur's tail, which had a whole string of bones down the end. Uh, if you look at the fossil of Archaeopteryx, and a lot of the primitive birds we find from the Cretaceous as well, they still have all their fingers, okay? And a modern bird's hand has no fingers anymore, right? It's just that little fused triangle of bone that you find on the end of your chicken wings that you normally don't eat because there's no meat on it. That fused up hand bone is where all their wing feathers attach. And so they don't use fingers anymore to fly. They use a support for a whole bunch of wing sh feather shafts. Uh, and then, of course, Archaeopteryx has teeth like a dinosaur. No bird alive has teeth. But birds do have the genes for teeth because you can mess around with the embryology of a chick and make a bird have uh, teeth again, but they won't be teeth of the animal you messed around with. They'll be teeth of dinosaurs. So it's, it's incredible how much dinosauria there is in birds and vice versa. So this actually I don't know the answer to. So when you do that, uh, and they call that, of course, an atavism, I believe, is what the, the kind of the... the yeah, atavism. Um, Evolution and throwback. Um, are they, when you do that to a chicken, is it actual teeth or is it more of a serration of the beak? No, no, it's actual teeth. Uh, these okay. things have teeth, and they, uh, there's embryos they do, and then they presumably would have lost them if they had ever grown up. They, these chicks, of course, don't grow up. They, they die, and then they're sacrificed to uh, analyze their tissues. Uh, but, uh, you know, there are ways you can mess. They've also made mess around with the genes uh, and gotten a dinosaurian snout instead of a beak. So they now have done that as well mm. with, with birds. Uh, they've also done other things as well, like messing around with the genes and gotten a long bony tail on a chicken. Not, they didn't grow up wow. to adulthood, but they were able to, to change the genetic controls on their, 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 their uh, 
their features so that they were able to re recover dinosaurian features, teeth, a beak, uh, or a, a snout instead of a beak, and the tail. All those things can be done by just messing around with the genes of uh, baby chicks. Can I ask a question real quick, Paul? Um, to to kind of yeah. tail end on mm -hmm. that. Um, is there any way to tell like what the, the colors or patterns that these dinosaur feathers um, had? Is there, is there any way to, to tell like what it may have looked like? Yeah, there's a few examples now known. Again, these are mostly from these extraordinary specimens from the Cretaceous of China that are reserved in these uh, uh, sort of these lakes that had no oxygen at the bottom when they died and were buried. And so they have not only all the feathers well preserved, but in many specimens they have what are called melanosomes, which are these little uh, little uh, little uh, pigments that are found inside the feather shafts. And they are preserved as they were when they were animals alive. So we can see some idea, especially the black and white contrasts. And in some cases, we can see reds and some as well. So there, if you look online, you'll see pictures of a number of these very primitive dinosaur bird transitional fossils that have been reliably reconstructed as to what color they were. Uh, their feathers, it has, uh, for example, one of them had stripes on its tail that went black and white, black and white all the way down. And others have combinations of black and other things on their feathers. Uh, that's the only place where we know that for sure. Uh, most dinosaurs, when you see them reconstructed, first of all, they're reconstructed without feathers, which is false. But even if they're reconstructed with feathers, for most dinosaur specimens, we don't have any actual evidence of what color they were. That's just artist's imagination. So 90% of the time, what you're looking at is an artist's guess of what color dinosaurs were, and we're really not sure. But those really, a few examples, we do now actually have direct evidence. Sweet. Okay, Bob. So I was going to ask you quick: Is there is there, yeah, if, go ahead. if these if these chicks have these atavisms for teeth, um, would it be indicative that that is the only possible way that they have the ability to grow teeth is some kind of lineage via evolution, um, cladistically? So when a young Earth creationist says, "Well, it's just you know a, a design, a similar design," how do you usually address that? Because in order to be a similar design, it would seem like every species on the planet would have they have the exact same abilities to do certain things um yeah no it's not they're very specifically yeah yeah very specifically but, dinosaur in shaped teeth and not only that but the way they did this in order to get these teeth to regrow was they took a baby chick and then they implanted the epithelium of the of the, of the uh, gums from a mouse okay a mammal and then impl implanted it on these growing chicks and then what they did, of course, the epithelium has potential to, to, to grow teeth again, which a normal ch uh, chick doesn't have. And so when the teeth grew, they didn't grow up to be mammal-like mouse teeth. That's when they showed up as dinosaur teeth. So the genes expressing teeth modified this mammal epithelium to make teeth that are not mammalian but dinosaurian. That's amazing. And I was just going to throw on with Kyle, I, I – um... This summer, I had the great chance. I lived near the Royal Terrell Dinosaur Museum, um, and they had an anatosaur recently who had still skin pigments, uh, and it was yeah, so. Yeah, there's several man now. Yeah, um, got to got to go to that with logic. That was kind of fun. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so one of the so one of the objections that uh, you know I hear about this whole line of thinking is that some dinosaurs are are what we call lizard hip dinosaurs. And some dinosaurs are yeah. what we call bird hip dinosaurs. But of course, yeah. you know, you crazy paleontologists, you think that birds evolve from the lizard hipped ones and not from the bird hipped right. ones. So what's the deal with that? Right. Okay, the, with that definition goes back to 1880s from a paleontologist named Harry Govier Seeley. And he noticed in the very early days of dinosaur discoveries, only a handful of them were known from anything that there was a fairly straightforward distinction between dinosaurs that he called lizard hip, which is basically the primitive condition for all reptiles. And the, the, the definition of that is the pubic bone, the bone that sticks out of the front of the uh, bones that are make up the hip around the, around the thigh bone uh, points forward, which is primitive for all reptiles. And so that's why he called them saw risky, a reptile hip. And then he noticed that a handful of the dinosaurs are known at that time, like Stegosaurus and a couple of others. The pubic bone has at least part of its part, uh, its uh, bone is flexed backwards. In some cases, it's all backwards, and it runs parallel to the bone in the, and that runs underneath the tail called the ischium. And so that was what they called the, the or bird hip dinosaur, an ornithischia, because modern birds have that. Uh, but the most primitive birds, uh, like Archaeopteryx, don't. 
they're still Sariskians, okay? Or they're on the, the, the cusp of transitioning it. And what it turns out, that condition is not a really great way to define things anymore because it happens multiple times. And usually what happens is that any dinosaur that needs more room in its uh, belly will move the pubic bone backward so that, that the, the belly area can expand. So it's actually happened in a number of other groups, called the oviraptorsaurs and therizinosaurs. Uh, all these guys are giant sort of swollen belly, uh, pot-bellied creatures that are huge plant eaters, and they've all done this independently in different ways, not exactly the same as birds and not exactly the same as ornithischians. So the distinction of just rotating the pelvis back is not enough. Uh, the pubic bone back usually is not enough. It's the, the way in which they do it in detail. And in this case, the way that ornithischians do it is very different from the way birds do it. So we can still use that characteristic, but we have to be very specific about what we mean. So basically, you're, it's, it's, uh, it's evolution that happens similarly in different lines. That's what... That's what right. It's parallel evolution for the same, the same pressures, right? If you need to get that pubic bone out of your way to have a giant belly for, for being an herbivore, then you tend to do that. But they do it in different ways, not all in the same way. Okay. Um, you've probably heard of uh, Dr. Alan Fiducia in your time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I know. I so, uh, so, so Alan, uh, famously, you know, doesn't believe that Archaeopteryx tells us, yeah. you know, that the birds, uh, the birds evolved from dinosaurs. In fact, you know, if you if you were to believe uh, most of my former friends and and people in this, Alan Fiducia is the spokesperson who says that this whole line of thinking is garbage. Um, what yeah. are, what is why does Alan say that? What is what's what's up with him? Um. It's a funny thing. It has a lot to do with the background that someone was trained in and their field they're in. So ornithologists as a whole, I know several other examples as well, who don't know the fossils, aren't paleontologists, and they also don't tend to be really think cladistically very well. They don't understand how we work when we talk about cladistics and, and analysis of relationships. They tend to think very differently than we do, and they're very I've always been reluctant to buy into the idea that birds are dinosaurs. And of course, and so a certain element of that, they, they think birds are special. Birds deserve their own rank. Birds should not be subsumed into any larger group like dinosaurs because it demeans birds. I think that's subconsciously what's there. Uh, but there are no people who actually work on dinosaur and bird fossils anymore that, dis that disagree with this idea. Uh, the last one was the late Larry Martin, University of Kansas, who died a few years back. He was the last objector among paleontologists, and now they've, he's gone. There's nobody left. Uh, because all paleontologists who are familiar with the direct evidence and have worked on these fossils all are in agreement. It's about as much of a consensus you'll ever find in the scientific field, where scientific field is normally not about consensus. Uh, normally, we are always fighting about things and disagreeing about things. But it's so much, it's a hundred some anatomical characters that make birds dinosaurs. And so what you're seeing among fiducia and a lot of ornithologists, and I know several like this, uh, is that it's just sort of an old school reaction to a new idea. Right? They just aren't comfortable with something that's so opposite to what they were trained to believe and what they were trained to understand. And as, as I said, they often don't get how cladistics works and how you have to be fair about uh, you know, how many characters support a particular uh, relationship. A lot of them, you know, as I said before, they're, they're emotionally connected to birds and birds are specialists. And that, that a lot of that has to do with that, that, that they'll, they'll find any way to nitpick the evidence. So with Fiducia and some others, and Larry Martin before when he passed away, would always nitpick about this or that small anatomical character and ignore the other 105. And that was a typical way to do it. It reminds you a lot of creationists in that respect because creationists do the same thing. They have nothing to show except they don't understand the evidence. So they find one little thing they think is weak and they'll ignore 99% of the evidence that doesn't, that doesn't agree with them. So in that respect, they're, they're just as dogmatic and they're just as outdated as creationists are. And, and it's a matter of time. I mean, as I said, Larry Martin passed away and the old guard and orthology is changing. They have a younger, newer uh, generation growing up there, I think, will be much more comfortable with it. Yeah, and that's, that's what I want to ask. Is, is the, we, the bandit movement, the birds are not dinosaur movement, is, yeah. is Alan Fiducia right. literally like the, the last of a dying breed on that? Well, if you count him as a paleontologist, yes. Uh, in other words, there are no other paleontologists I know of now that Larry Martin's gone that are the not dino deniers among them. Uh, the remaining deniers are all ornithologists who don't really work on fossil birds, and so that's. Now, that's I find that kind of weird because we had a uh, we had Dr. Mary Schweitzer on um, a while, a long while on, on my other channel, oh, yeah. and 
and uh, and and Paula Gia was engaged with her, and it was it was one of the the, the greatest discussions I've ever had. And she was talking very specifically about her studies, obviously dealing with ostriches, and the findings she's finding is that they're clearly somehow relating to dinosaurs. That's why she's using uh, ostriches in her experiments, is it not? Because of the relationship yeah. on the yeah. medullary bone. Yeah. If you want a lot if you want a large bird that's alive still that's what you got <laughs> the ostrich and a few others you know so yeah and so you know she's a generation that grew up already understanding that as a student so she doesn't have any problems with it it's just really really old generation people who were trained in a different era so the era that just preceded mine and it's it's a gradual generational change you know those old guard gradually disappear or their influence stops being important anymore which actually leads me into uh, another thought. I don't know if you're familiar with her work with osteocytes. Are you familiar with Mary, Mary's work? Yeah, I've, I've followed a little bit of it. Uh, it's not something I'm really trained to say a lot about, but go ahead. Well, I guess I was just wondering if you could explain to the audience. So one of her claims is that, um, you know, she tried to bind the osteocytes or to, to determine whether these even were osteocytes in her findings uh, with, with like uh, alligator DNA and with other, with other, not, I think enzymes is right. Where is that right? Um, with alligator enzymes, with with uh, ostrich enzymes, and am I am I saying this correctly that the only things you could get to bind to these osteocytes were avian uh, proteins? I believe that's right. Yeah, and that's it should make sense because you know the, these uh, th you know, T Rex is actually on the branch that's close to birds, right? It's a theropod, and so if there's anything alive today that should be genetically similar, it would be bird. Uh, Steve, did you have any? Uh, I just kind of I think oh, I exhaust my normal objections. Go ahead. Okay. You know. No, I, um, I, 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 no, I just thought it was. I just thought it was weird that because we were talking about uh, the the fact that it's only the um, the people that study birds for some reason don't accept bird evolution uh, from dinosaurs, and yet when you do these experiments, you generally use. Uh, oh bird yeah, I know. So I, I, I just I can't I can't see why they well, they don't accept it. It's, it's, it has a lot to do with the way new ways of thinking go through certain subdivisions in science. Um, and I saw this happen when I was a graduate student in the American Museum in the 1970s and 1980s. That was the time the cladistic thinking first swept through much of the profession. And the American Museum was where it started in the United States, at least. Uh, so I got in on the ground floor when cladistics came along. And it was funny. You'd see some departments where they completely converted and, and were completely interested in cladistic thinking and, and doing all the cutting edge uh, new thoughts about it. And that was in the Mary Museum was the Department of, uh, of uh, Ichthyology, Gary Nelson and Don Rosen, who were some of the earliest American uh, zoologists to ever talk about cladistics. They were ones who then got their department on board and gradually got my, my, uh, my professors at the Merrick Museum and vertebrate paleontology on board. So my advisor, Malcolm McKenna, was one of the first mammal paleontologists ever to draw a cladogram and publish it. Um, but at the same token, you had other departments like mammalogy and ornithology, both of which were very old-fashioned with old guys who hadn't changed their thinking in many years. And they were the, the, the sort of the stick in the muds, you know, the last resistors. It took them a while for some of them to ever get used to it, although most of those old guard that so re re resist to what was changing have all passed on now and they have a new generation of people in their chairs. But uh, this, this is not unusual. Some fields are, say, for some more forward-looking than others, more open to change than others. And you'll see some fields jump way ahead and come very uh, sometimes radical with the new ideas that are coming along. And others will be very traditional and take a long time to change especially if the uh, dominant figures are old-fashioned and don't, uh, don't give up their uh, jobs soon enough, and so they get outdated. It's the way science is. It's a human process, right? It's a community. Any, a community any, has any, any profession. And you actually yeah. got me yeah, excited about yeah, a, different, a different line of question. I'm going to take a break from the, my old young earth objections for a moment, and I want to actually talk to you about – so it's, it's nearly the end of the year. Uh, everyone puts out their top 10 things about 2018 or whatever, looking back. Um, what things happened in 2018? What are the top few things, you know, from a paleontology or an evolutionary biology standpoint? Oh, okay. Um, should we lay people be excited about what happened this year that we can point to and say, new thing, 2018? Yeah, I've seen some people put lists together. I haven't really paid much attention to it. Um, or, 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 or alternately, like what, tr what trends, what new, uh, you know, what, what's exciting uh, in your field that's happening 
that we should be paying attention to well, more than we are. Yeah, they're, they're mostly ongoing things. It's just a little bit every year that makes it more interesting. Um, you know, I don't work on dinosaurs to, for research purposes, but I have to keep up with it. And now I teach a dinosaur course at Cal Poly. I have to really keep up with it. But uh, lots of new discoveries among dinosaurs have occurred. Uh, so we see a lot of these uh, things we didn't really know, like uh, more examples of coloration and more examples of uh, details. Uh, one of my former students uh, was able to show one of these birds from China that, that uh, she was able to show the soft preservation of the gizzard and the stomach and all these other things that are now thought to be not preservable were actually preserved in a specimen. And so that was something that was quite interesting. Um, and then, um, you know, this discovery just a couple weeks ago, I briefly mentioned earlier that pterosaurs may not have had uh, some kind of a fiber that's unrelated to feathers, but actually really had feathers. Uh, that's been claimed now. The pterosaurs are not just covered by what's called used to be called pinkna fibers, but are covered by feathers, which would really, as I said, shake things up, because that means that feathers started with a common ancestor of pterosaurs plus dinosaurs, not in the base of dinosaurs, not with birds, of course. And so feathers are universal to the entire branch of animals. And of course, many of them may have lost, it, especially if they got large body sizes like T. Rex and things like that. But uh, as chicks or as babies or hatchlings, whatever you want to call them, since they're so bird-like in a lot of other ways, uh, it's good to imagine them as having feathers then. So that's part of it. Um, in my field, there's always new areas in fossil mammals that are interesting and new discoveries being made. Um, I like to think about one I just did about a year ago uh, where we, uh, we did some work on saber-toothed tigers and showed how they grew up. It turns out they start out with really heavy uh, wrestlers, Schwarzenegger-style front limbs when they're, when they're, when they're kittens. And they, they're, they're power, powerfully built from the moment they're born. They don't grow into becoming powerful. They start that way. So that was something a student and I worked on about a year ago and published, and it was in PLS1, so it got a fair number of press attention. Uh, you know, we're all working on different kinds of things, and, you know, I'm trying to work on a bunch of different things in fossil mammals mostly, uh, but there's always some new stuff coming along. It's why I go to the professional meetings every year. Let me ask a, a follow-up question on that, Paul, real quick. Um, in, with the saber-tooth saber uh, tigers and, um, like, uh, woolly mammoths, um, I know that there are, there are several different um, ideas of – in the different periods that dinosaurs have been around, what led to, you know, each group's extinction, extinction. Um, what's the, the, the theory behind why the, the mammoths and things like the saber toothed tigers, those kind of mammals all died out. Uh, that's a very big topic, which it takes several hours to do a good job on. But uh, in a nutshell, uh, it's a complicated story. I mean, there's a group of people who are still determined to say it's all humans who did it especially here in North America and down in South America when the disappearance of a lot of these animals more or less coincides with the appearance of certain kinds of uh, arrowheads and, and spear points, uh, the so-called Clovis culture. But it turns out recent stuff has shown that humans are here much earlier than they thought, not 10,000 years ago when the Ice Age mammals died out, but closer to 13 to 16,000 years ago, long before Ice Age mammals died out. So if, if humans did it, they did it after they'd already gotten used to these animals and animals got used to them, which sort of throws that whole thing in a, in a sort of a questionable state. And then there's other arguments that climate did it, uh, except it's uh, not the only time that we had a change from glacial to interglacial conditions. So it's hard to say that that climate's a whole story. Uh, there's, a not a, you know, there's not a clear answer is really the simple way to say it. It's very complicated. And I would say that in general, most ideas and most uh, arguments in science are because it is complicated. It doesn't lend itself to a simple yes or no answer. Mm. Awesome. All right, Paul. Am I frozen? Am I still there? Uh, your picture is frozen, yes, but I can still hear you. All right. That was good. Um, well, actually, led, you were all over the map on different uh, directions there. Um, we gave you all kinds of good oh, questions. But well, you might have to. Uh, oh, hang on, Paul. You might have to refresh. Yeah, refresh the, refresh your browser yeah. real quick. It um, it's it's choppy on there. So while we're waiting on Paul to come back, let me just ask this uh, random question: How long will it be before you're talking earlier about being able to give uh, you know, chickens teeth, or the dino teeth? How long before we can actually resurrect a a dinosaur? Is that possible? Uh, that. Yeah, that's been talked about a lot, but the problem is, um, in most cases, uh, the, as, as, as if anybody who's ever told you about the, the myths behind Jurassic Park, all dinosaur DNA is far too degraded to ever be used in any real sense. 
I mean, it's like 1% of it's left, and if we're lucky in a case of something like Mary Schweitzer has, and you don't have enough original dinosaur DNA to ever rec recover a dinosaur other than maybe a more primitive version of the birds we have now. Because, uh, you know, sure, you can start with the bird's DNA and try to re reverse engineer parts of it, but you don't have enough to make a dinosaur that we would recognize as a dinosaur. And that's a big problem because DNA breaks down very, very fast, unlike uh, what they did in Jurassic Park. It does not retrieve from the guts of mosquitoes or any place like that. In fact, it de decays almost as soon as the animal dies. And it's so, it's so fragile and decays so fast, as a matter of fact, that they have made many, many attempts now to recover the DNA of mammoths that have only been dead for 10,000 years and actually well-preserved, freeze-dried in the, uh, the Siberian tundra. And those have already degraded so badly they can't use it to ever recover a live mammoth. Uh, if that's the case, I wouldn't worry about ever seeing another dinosaur other than birds. And uh, do you think that uh, movies like Jurassic Park, does that help or hurt sort of your your field? Like, do you think that that gives – did that give off more misconceptions about dinosaurs that you then have to go back and try to, you know, right their wrongs? Or is it pretty – um, accurate to how how they were uh it's both um the first movie in 1993 of course was Cry based on Crichton's original novel and Crichton had made the effort to get up to date on what people thought about dinosaurs in 1993 so therefore the movie itself is fairly good for the standards of when it was filmed because it does show this you know very active very fast moving and mostly animals moving on two legs with their tails streaking straight out behind them all that stuff is accurate as we knew it back then. And so in that way, the first Jurassic Park movie and book, of course, which it came from, helped to break down all these old stereotypes of dinosaurs, sluggish, stupid lizards who dragged their tails and lived in swamps, all of which are now known not to be true. But the problem was the movie then got locked into its essentially a time warp in 1993. And by 1996, we started getting the first of these feathered dinosaurs from China and by the end of the, the decade, as they made the second Jurassic Park movie, it was very clear that most dinosaurs, certainly Velociraptor, would have been completely covered with feathers. And yet the movie makers were told this and chose not to. And they did this repeatedly in other movies as well, where they had anyone tell them what the paleontology community agrees on and what the evidence shows, they always went for whatever was better for the story are better mm. for the scariness. So I've read somewhere that, that Spielberg and others said, well, if they had feathers, they'd look like chickens. They're not scary enough, so we're going to leave them naked. You know, that, so, so that's it's a movie. creative <laughs> license, though, right? I mean, I kind of get that as a creative license. They're, they're the, the <laughs> well, I know. not there to see, promote the science. There, I agree. It's a movie. It's fiction. You know, they're entitled to what they ever want. It's not a real story. But they got so much right in the first movie, and yeah. they have such a potential – to keep people up to date because they're the way most people learn about paleontology. They don't learn mm -hmm. it from books. They don't learn it from TV documentaries. They learn it from movies. Sad to mm -hmm. say because movies are not true, mm -hmm. uh, but unless they're documentaries. But in this case, they, they had a great opportunity. They could have kept that going. They could have found a way to have a, a, a plot device where they recovered the feathers that dinosaurs actually had and had their velociraptors covered with feathers by Jurassic Park 2, which they, by that time they knew what the reality was. They chose not to. And that's a missed well, in opportunity. World, in, my they, mind. Uh, yeah. in Jurassic World, they, they addressed the new scene in, in where, they, where they're re-engineering dinosaurs. And he talks about they say we're suppressing the feathers because that's not what our tourists yeah, I think know, dinosaurs I know. look like. Yeah, so <laughs> that shows they you that, that they it's an admission of guilt, right? They, they know what it they is. should have done, but they don't want to do it, so therefore they put in a line to make it fit their fit their uh, pre, uh, uh, preferred uh, story. Uh, that you know that's their choice. It's to me, as I said, it's a missed opportunity. They could have educated people, and they do. The biggest share of education about dinosaurs comes from them, much more than it comes to scientists or any other educator. They mm -hmm. could have done it right. They chose not to. A T-Rex covered in feathers to me is, is much more scarier than uh, one covered in scales. Like that, that to me is frightening. Well, yeah, I and mean, since we don't know what the color of most of those feathers were, you could have made the feathers pretty frightening too. So, uh, I mean, they wouldn't have been large feathers. They've been, you know, because feathers originally evolved, as far as you can tell, from the animals we have them from now as a body covering to hold in body heat. And the pterosaurs had them for that reason, and so do dinosaurs. And so they don't necessarily have to have large surface areas. They don't necessarily have to be bright colors, but they can. Um, 
But either way, they have nothing to do with flight at all. That's another thing that a lot of people get wrong. Think that you can't have uh, feathers unless you're a flying animal. But no, flying is a very late what they call an X adaptation or a a uh, you know a, a sort of a jury rig thing that feathers later deserve turned out to be, to be useful for, but not their original function. Is it fair to say that most of our uh, fossils about these bird transitions come from China? Well, the biggest number of them now are coming from these uh, lounging beds in China, uh, just because they have an extraordinary setting there with a bunch of these fossil lakes of early Cretaceous age that are, you know, the, the lakes were filled with volcanic ash over and over again. They get really stagnant, and lots of things died, not just birds, but fossil mammals. A bunch of stuff is now known from them that preserve all these soft tissues. Now, we do have them from a few other places. And, of course, the, the original Archaeopteryx specimens don't have color, but they have feathers. That's how we knew the Archaeopteryx is a bird the first time it was found. So, yes, there are other places as well that are producing some, but by far the best place to see them is in China. So uh, the follow-up question, I guess, to that is that, of course, uh, there have been, you know, there have been hoaxes that have been, you know, false fossils come yep. out of China. And so, unfortunately, that creates a bit of a broad brush uh, of being able to dismiss anything that comes out of China. Uh, you know, do you have an yeah, answer know, kind of to that objection? Yep, yep. Uh, the one example you're thinking of is what they called um, Eoraptor. Um, oh, wait, no, that's what I'm thinking. No. Anyway, uh, or Archaeoraptor. Anyway, it was a it was a hybrid of two okay. different specimens that were put together, not to deliberately as a hoax, so far as we can tell. The original Chinese farmer who found it uh, put it together because he was trying to increase its market value, make it look more complete, because unfortunately a lot of those things are sold in the black market. And so that's the reason for it, not to, to fool scientists. And then the people who brought it to this country bought it and brought it to this country and were going to publicize it were not paleontologists. They were a group of paleo artists. And they got National Geographic to jump in before it had ever been looked at by scientists. As soon as people like Phil Curry and other scientists who know their way around these fossils looked at it, they realized right away that it was a composite. It was a thing that was patched together from more than one specimen. And then they realized it wasn't a real complete animal. And so that should have been the end of it. But because National Geographic is not a peer-reviewed science journal, it's trying to sell you know, copies, or at least it was back then when it was in better shape, um, that they didn't listen to the scientists. They published it, and so the whole thing ended up being a big uh, black eye for National Geographic. But it was not a black eye for the scientific committee. No scientists were fooled. Okay, The minute real scientists like Phil Curry and others who know their uh, birds from China looked at it, they knew what it was. They knew it was a composite. It wasn't a deliberate hoax to try to fool scientists because it obviously didn't do a very good job. It was a, it was a patched together sort of chimera, as we would call it, something patched from several different animals to make it a, a better specimen to sell on the market. That's where we got, and it, it, since that time, there have been no other similar cases like that. You know, scientists who know what they're doing don't get fooled. Was it something kind of similar like the Nebraska man then? Because what I, what I found is that the Archaeoraptor is confused with Archaeopteryx a lot. And they, yeah, they, well, people throw out there that Archaeoraptor is a forgery similar, right? and it's not. Yeah, 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 no. of course. But Archaeopteryx they, they, they is known for 12 out. very good specimens. So. Yeah, Archaeopteryx but, but is not the, a forgery. It's not for 12 very good specimens. Forgery, thank you. No one's ever shown it. Yeah. It was, it was just a composite, totally just like Nebraska man, but it wasn't actually a forgery trying to, do, like, Piltdown man was clearly a forgery. Right. So there was a distinction there. Uh, okay. Piltdown man was a forgery. Nebraska man is a different story. Uh, Nebraska man was one scientist who's not very competent getting ahead of his data. The guy was Henry Fairfield Osborne, but just because he was the president of the American Museum of Natural History and also the head of the Bird Paleontology Division, he went ahead and took this very bad single tooth, which is really worn down, and anyone in the right mind would said, this can't be determined as what it is. But uh, Osborne was very convinced that humans had been in North America much earlier. So he looked at this really worn, what turned out to be a peccary tooth, which I actually work on that peccary myself, uh, peccary tooth, and misinterpreted it because it was not, not a good enough specimen for anyone to determine what it was. And made a big fuss about this Nebraska man, or Hesperpithecus is its formal name. And even the people in his own department didn't buy it. But because he was powerful and because he was influential, his stuff was published and nobody stopped him. And then within a year, they'd all basically found better specimens of the same thing in the same beds that were not as worn down and showed, yes, it was a peccary tooth after all. And it sort of quietly died. And for as far as paleontology is concerned, it's a dead issue. It's an invalid name that we put in our list of other invalid names that have been attached to all sorts of specimens over the years. But creations, of course, think it's a sign of incompetence. Well, one, one paleontologist who definitely was incompetent but too powerful for his own good made a mistake. 
And the scientists themselves corrected it within a year. So it doesn't speak too well to creationists. What do you say to people who um, – like, like there's a couple people in the, in, in the live chat that – I mean, I, I can't tell if they're, they're they're trolling or whatever, but they 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 claim fossils aren't um, you know a a a real thing. Um, and they one thing that they point to is the the fact that fossils you never find a full complete set. Can you can you kind of speak to that, like um, why that is, and and why even though you can't you don't find a full set, you're still able to kind of map out what the the dinosaur actually looked like. Well, they're false in both respects. Uh, first of all, there are dinosaurs and a number of things actually known from very complete skeletons with every bone preserved. Uh, and I can think of, for example, the Carnegie Museum baby camera sword that's on display there and in many other places are copies of it. There's a number of others that are completely articulated. All those birds, for example, that you find in the, uh, the Cretaceous of, of uh, China, there's every bone is there as long as, the, as well as their feathers. So it's not true that we never find all the specimen intact. Now, they aren't, they, they aren't the norm, they're the exception, but there are quite a few of them, and so that's a lie if anyone tells you that. Most of the time, yes, carcasses get eaten, get scavenged, get broken up by water currents, bones get disassociated, so most specimens are not known from complete material, but a good anatomist doesn't need every bone to know what's going to be there. It's a part of basic comparative anatomy and vertebrate paleontology since the days of Cuvier 200 years ago that we know pretty much what other kinds of bones an animal will have based on what we have already especially if it's partially complete. And so, yes, we can patch together partial skeletons and we can reconstruct what we think is there. And usually, if they're honest, you'll see when they do a reconstruction, they'll show the bones that are known from the bones that are inferred in different color patterns. So you can judge for yourself whether you think they're doing the right thing or not. Uh, and we do that usually repeatedly when these things are published and the illustrations of these specimens are shown. Uh, but the, the big point being here is that it's not fakery. Paleontologists are trained in comparative anatomy. I can recognize most fossil mammals from a single tooth, and most many of my colleagues can do that too. I can recognize most fossil mammals from certain parts of their skeleton. Uh, that just comes with damn experience. And these people who say this had never looked at a fucking bone. Okay, that's it. Uh, Dwayne Gish is famous for saying these ridiculous things about fossils. <laughs> Nobody ever pointed out to him that he was a biochemist, that he has no experience in bones. He doesn't know one bone from another. He's talking out of his ass, or was while he was alive. Uh, and yeah. so that's the problem. He's quite, he's quite dead. <laughs> we had a, yeah, we had a gentleman come on here. Uh, we had a gentleman come on on this show. Actually, we did a, um, a debate. Trevor Valley uh, debated this guy, but he claimed that this order, uh, several, <laughs> many years ago, is responsible for burying what we find. What we found was fossils oh, yeah, well, in order to to trick the Earth into thinking that the. Uh, Making people think yep, that the earth there is are, <laughs> it is. There are people who believe that. And of course, that's the old Omphalos argument from Philip Kennedy Gossi way back 150 years ago, just before Darwin. The idea that the earth is, looks old because God created it to be that way, as if it had a history. And of course, that was because Gossi himself was a good enough biologist in the days before Darwin. You could see that life showed a history and it looked like it evolved, but he didn't want to believe it. So he created that Omphalos hypothesis. And the usual response to that is, for a, a scientist, that's laughable. And for a religious person, it makes God into a great trickster. And so either way, it's not satisfying to either side. <laughs> and also it's point. untestable, right? It's a scientific way to do that, uh, <laughs> test that hypothesis. And we can go ahead and throw so, out yeah, the, the so dinosaurs. Basically, if anyone ever... says to you it's possible or fake, just tell them, go out on one of these digs sometime and find the bones yourself. And there's nobody been there before you. They're in solid rock. Nobody had a chance to do that. In fact, most cases, nobody's ever been to the spot. When you find bones, you're the first person there. And it's not – no no possibility that anyone's faked that. While we're at it, let's, can we dispel the myth that, um, that men walked with dinosaurs as well? Yep. Um, well, the birds, of course, which are still walking with us now. Uh, but, yes uh, – the, uh, the only time that's been seriously taken up by the creationist community was in the days when they were trying to push the Paluxy River tracks in Texas as evidence of human tracks with dinosaurs. And the dinosaur tracks in Paluxy, of course, are real. They're famous lower Cretaceous bed that has sauropod and theropod tracks all over it. I've been there. It's a pretty spectacular place. But the so-called human tracks, they are a combination of things. Many of them, if you look at the pictures that are shown, they are obviously hoaxes that were carved by someone to sell to the market 
because that was the word that was out from way before the Great Depression. And if you look at him closely, the hoaxes are clearly hoaxes because the footprint doesn't look like an actual human footprint. It does not have the proper you know, ways in which the toes embed, in which the arch of the foot is there. It's all just chiseled flat like the guy had terrible flat feet. Uh, so you now we can tell right away it's a hoax. The uh, most common example of what are supposed human footprints at Paluxy River are these theropod tricks, tracks that are three-toed initially, but the side toes are shallow. And when the mud slumps back into the uh, central toe imprint, it looks sort of human-like if you look at it. Uh, but those are just a consequence of the way that sediment res responded to their three-toed animal walking across it. And it's been documented many times. And in fact, the creations themselves mostly now reject the Paluxy River site as evidence of humans walking with dinosaurs. They say, don't use this argument anymore because they've been embarrassed too many times. It's clearly uh, not a very su supportive area for them. Perfect. How do we dinosaur fossils? Like how do we, like, you know, how do we know that someone didn't bury them there? Is How do we, how do we date these things? Because obviously carbon 14 doesn't apply. That's right. Well, you said I mean, several questions you asked me. How do you find them? You go to the right age beds, right? So if you're looking for Jurassic dinosaurs, you look in Jurassic beds, especially like the Morrison Formation, Upper Jurassic, all over the Rocky Mountain region. If you walk along the Morrison Formation long enough and you know what to look for, and that's usually what the creationists don't know how to do. But if you know how to recognize fossil bone when you see it, you'll find fossil bone. It's very rich. And there's lots of stuff there. And every year, my friends are out in the Morrison Formation every summer. They come back with lots more dinosaurs because that place is a But isn't that just dinosaur. circular? If you're, you're, if you're just looking for Jurassic, if you, just, if you call a lair Jurassic and then you say that those are Jurassic fossils, isn't that a circular? Uh, no, no. I'm, the, you just call it a lair Jurassic, you get what fossils you get. If I were to go to the Dakota Formation or the Hell Creek Formation or Lance Formation, which are later Cretaceous, I get totally different dinosaurs. Nothing like the Jurassic dinosaurs, and that's the point. The geologic time, every di every slice of geologic time has different kinds of dinosaurs in it. You don't get any any layer which has the same dinosaurs, and that's by itself a pretty big uh, indictment of flood geology right there. Now, that was the first part of your question. Then you mentioned how we date them. Another long mm -hmm. story, but to make it short, uh, you go with places where you have volcanic ash, and it has rain down in the middle of your sedimentary beds where your fossils are, uh, that's the best kind of evidence, or lava flows sometimes if you don't have volcanic ashes. Volcanic ashes came out of a volcano, so they have minerals that's crystallized as the magma cooled, and that crystal locks in whatever uh, radioisotopic dating system you're looking for, which is usually potassium argon or rocks that age. And so you take the best crystals you can out of that particular volcanic ash. You do a whole bunch of techniques to clean them up and to avoid anything that's contaminated. And if you get a bunch of consistent dates out of all the individual crystals out of that volcanic ash, then you have some confidence it's probably real. Uh, but these people who do this, this uh, dating of rocks that old, they're the most hard-boiled skeptics you'll ever find. They don't believe even their own data until they've run it seven or eight times. And so the idea that they'd fake it or that they deliberately publish bad data uh, is laughable because if anyone doesn't believe their own data, it's them. And yet they are very hard-boiled, and they're very skeptical and very self-critical, and they don't publish stuff so they're really sure. Yeah, I, I, so have you, not, uh, uh, real quick, have you ever dealt with Dr. Humphreys? Doesn't ring a bell. Sorry. He, he's, actually, he, he's actually an astrophysicist, but he, he did work with the rate project on the helium diffusion rates. Yeah. Yeah, but, I'm not uh, too, too familiar with that one there. I've heard a little bit about it, but I don't know the details to be able to answer it very well. Well, we, in reference to your data, we I, we had Dr. Uh, Hinky and Dr. Le Sheldon, a geophysicist, and uh, they came on and they tried to get him to release his data. Uh, he actually mm -hmm. finally decided to publish something, but of course, where was it published? The Journal of Creation. Creation's Journal. Uh, Yep. Creationist Journal, right. Because the information that he had, they both explained in great detail was was basically the, the, the data that he had was correct, but he, he was only looking at a, at a very specific part of it. So, so it was skewed yep. in his favor. But when you took it occlusively uh, as a whole, it clearly was ca completely counter to what he had. Plus, he made one mathematical huge change. He decided to, for whatever reason, change uh Paul, did you remember did he change natural log yeah, was, to base 10 or the other way around it was uh natural logs to logs yeah natural yeah. log to yeah. base 10. yeah because yeah, yeah. usually when you have log it, is, it implies natural log nowadays in math but he it was as it was a log formula of using natural log and in order to make it fit his data he completely changes to log base 10 just because it was suited it better 
<laughs> yep, that's not allowed in real science. And see, the thing is, you know, if he really were honest, he would have submitted to a peer review journal that had real scientists checking that, and of course, probably now get published right. because they would have caught those mistakes before it got published. But a creation journal has nobody competent to read those things, so they they're willing to rubber stamp it. So, what um, is an index fossil, and how are those related to dating? Uh, index fossils sort of a shorthand way to describe fossils that are really helpful because they are very uh, very widespread, they're very abundant, and they tend to evolve very fast. So each species is very distinct from the next. And so you find them, you pretty much know you're in a very narrow time slice when you have that particular kind of fossil. Uh, it's not by any means the only thing we need. I mean, most uh, biostratigraphic dating is done with a whole slew of fossils where we look at their total range in time and in rock and we uh, you know, calculate these re regressions between different sections, and you can get very precise dating when you do that. That's a common, common technique used in oil companies and all around geology, and basically uh, anytime you want to date rocks, you have lots of fossils. But you know, for a quick and dirty way, for example, if you're in a particular formation and you see a very famous fossil that's typical of that formation, you call it an index fossil. But it's not, not by only means the, the fastest way to tell something's there. So that's not how they determined. It's not a circular thing. No, it's not circular. No, index fossils is saying this fossil is particularly useful to recognize this time slice or this formation. But there are hundreds of other fossils that we could also use. And so that's the point. These people don't realize it's not, not something special. It's just something that's really easy to spot and usually very abundant and very, very distinctive. So anybody who knows their first thing about fossils will know that that's here for Grimes Eye, and I must be in the Burlington Limestone because that's the index fossil of that formation. That's all it, it tells you. Um, Paul, did you have uh, any more questions, or if I'll, I'll, do you may get a, the, well, there's a, quite a few in the live chat. Yeah, I was going to say, let's throw it a live chat for a while if you want. Okay, um, I'm going to start out with one that um, I, I believe is is very important to to get an answer to in the wake of the uh, the hit film this year, The Meg. Is the megalodon, <laughs> is it possible that the megalodon still exists in our oceans? No. Simple answer. The Perfect. oldest, known, uh, the youngest known fossil of megalodon, that's what you should say, actually, when you say megalodon, that's actually the name of a clam. The correct name is Carcaracles megalodon. Uh, the oldest fossil of Carcaracles megalodon is 2 million years old. And they died yeah. out sometime during the Ice Ages. And there's... The oceans are not that unexplored, especially for an animal that large. I just I would say the chance is approaching zero that it's still alive. I'm just screwing everyone's name up today. It's the, it's the, the theme that I have. Oh no, the whole public. And then when you make a movie with the wrong name in the title, everyone learns it the wrong way. Okay, let's get to uh, some serious questions now. Um, TJ Jump asks, uh, how much does punctuated equilibrium contribute to evolution versus Darwinian evolution? Well, it's not versus Darwinian evolution. It's part of it. And that's the first misunderstanding creationists often have. They th think punctuated equilibrium somehow denies evolution occurs. I was actually trained by Niles Eldridge. He was one of the people that I was me mentored by and a very good friend of Stephen Jay Gould uh, until he passed. And uh, so I know it from the ground up. And all that punctuated equilibrium says is this basic idea that if you look at modern species and at what it takes for modern species to form, which is what's called speciation theory, the idea is how species form. We know this since the 1940s, we've known this actually. Species form in small, little isolated populations with unusual gene frequencies that are often on the edge of the main population, that's why they're called peripheral isolates, uh, and that they form what's called allopatrically, weighing from the main population. The main population doesn't change very much because there's too many genes being exchanged, too much gene flow or mating between individuals for much of a, uh, a genetic difference to develop. But at small populations, the subsample, the main population, will have unusual genes just by the fact it's a small sample. And if they stay isolated, they will develop unusual gene frequencies until they are a new species. And that's the fundamental way in which we think most species form on the planet today. But that is happening on biological timescales. Happens within generations, you know, maybe decades to a century at most. And geologists can't see anything that happens that fast, right? Most of our bedding planes are thousands of years apart. So something that happens like that so quickly uh, is not going to show up in the fossil record. What shows up instead is that species form fairly quickly as far as geologists are concerned. It's too fast for us to see it. Once they form, they're fairly stable. So that's the equilibrium part of it, right? The punctuation is the fairly rapid speciation event by a geologist's viewpoint, which is millions of years. 
And then the equilibrium is how the species is stable from that point forward. So now as the Steve we actually realized this is something paleontologists had known for 100 years. Most species of fossil record don't change through time. They're very sta static. They're very stable. And it's only rare that you see transitions between them and that they, they start tra uh, changing gradually. And that debate was started in 1972 when they published the original paper, the year I started college. And I watched it go through the entire my entire educational career and years since then, it's been one of the most productive and interesting debates in paleontology. And the uh, sort of the takeaway message is that we now realize that most uh, animals and plants that don't aren't single-celled and asexual, but are sexual organisms, do in fact show stasis and punctuation. And very, very few examples of gradualism because that's what the fossil record should look like because of the nature of the process is too fast for us to see in the rock record. So in that case, Gould and Elders were vindicated uh, and very grad, it's just like we were talking about earlier with the people who resisted new ideas till the day they died with the, with the dinosaurs or birds. Same story here, although most of the people who resisted and functional equilibrium get gone now. So that idea has pretty much become mainstream thinking. And I've actually personally worked on this a lot. Uh, I've done research on fossil mammals, the big badlands, and shown that mammals, the big badlands, mostly go right across the biggest climate change of the last 55 million years without doing anything. They do not respond to climate change, contrary to what a lot of people think they should do. Uh, and then more recently, when my students and I have been working in a place like La Brea Tar Pits, which is only about an hour from here, uh, we've done a lot of research on the mammals from La Brea Tar Pits, which uh, go back to 35,000 years ago, and they span the entire last glacial interglacial cycle. So we have a big climate change here in the Los Angeles area. During the peak glacier around here, it was pine trees and snow in Hollywood, okay? So that was the norm. And the, yet all the mammals, all the birds we worked on, we worked on everything that's common enough to do this kind of study with, show no change in size or shape or anything else, no matter how cold the weather got here. They just basically don't give a damn, as, as Butler would say. And so um, this, this is a, becoming a more common thing. We've realized how much stasis and how much resistance to change is very much part of everything we see in the fossil record. But the, the, the bigger thing is that creationists will take that out of context and say, oh, they've disproven Darwinism. No, it's very much in the context of modern uh, evolutionary theory. It's just a side aspect of it. Uh, it does challenge a lot of the ideas that biologists had that they that species are infinitely flexible. And they're always changing in response to the environment. You know, the kind of model that Galapagos Finches is always used as an example of. It changes us in thinking about that because we can see in the fossil record, if you have a long enough time span, which most biologists don't, the, fossil, the, the animals in the fossil record do not respond to climate over the long run. They may fluctuate a little bit, but they always end up back where they started. And that's sort of a challenge is one tiny piece of Darwinian theory, but it's not by any means a, de a denial of evolution. Is it fair to summarize what you just said as um, major changes require major pressures? Like, is that... Is that a reasonable summary? Uh, yeah, may, we don't even know what pressures are there. We, we can postulate some ideas, but what we do know from the fossil record is that species, when they show up, they're fairly stable, and then whatever happens, we often really can't tell you what happened in most cases. They either speciate to become something else, or they go extinct. Uh, okay. But they don't change a lot. Once they were species, they say very similar for very long periods of time. Um, the next question is from uh, Twisted Shadow Mazes. Thank you for the super chat. Um, they ask, for those of <laughs> us uh, not well versed in paleontology, can you please explain what makes something like a T Rex and a Velociraptor dinosaurs, but not pterosaurs? Okay. Um, they have all the characteristics that dinosaurs have to have, starting with one of the things unique to dinosaurs. If you ever see a dinosaur skeleton on display, especially if you've ever done one of these model kits of dinosaurs, their hip socket is an open hole, right? The uh, thigh bone, with the, the head of the thigh bone, the head of the femur, we call it, fits in an open hole. And it's not a ball and socket joint like you have in your hip or in your shoulder or any other animal has. It's unique to the hole runs right through the hips, hips, hips uh, joint. And that's unique to dinosaurs, not found in pterosaurs. Um, there are a bunch of other characteristics dinosaurs have. Uh, they have, for example, reduced and almost all have lost their pinky finger, and some of them have lost their third finger, and T-Rex is down to two fingers, the index finger and the uh, thumb. Uh, that's unique to the dinosaur in hand. Um, there's a bunch of other characteristics. I could, it's just an anatomical list that's quite long. Uh, the only place that's challenging is when you get these very, very primitive things that are almost dinosaurs but not quite, and then you see just a couple of subtle changes here and there, which is exactly what evolution would predict. Okay. Um the next question is from uh, 
Kendall uh, Frey. Uh, what info, if any, can be extracted from what's left of dinosaur DNA? Not much. Uh, dinosaur DNA is about 99% degraded, even in the best circumstances. It does not survive. So uh, contrary to Jurassic Park and Michael Crichton, that's all fiction, remember, there is no you know, dinosaur DNA other than that of birds, of course, which is not what he's thinking, I'm sure. Okay. Um, the next one is from the, the Faz. Where in Australia can I find fossils? It's tough. Australia doesn't have very many uh, places where the rocks are eroded and uplifted because it's tectonically pretty quiet. Um, there have been lots of late Ice Age mammals found on the old lake beds like Lake Eyre and the others in South Australia, which are now dried up but have uh, the remains of Ice Age mammals like these big uh, wombats the size of rhinos and kangaroos twice the size of the biggest kangaroo we have today. Uh, those have been found. In a few places, uh, very few places, like Dinosaur Cove on the south coast of uh, New South Wales, they have things like a uh, very small number of dinosaurs found there. My old friend Pat, Tom and Pat Rich found those. Um, Australia is not an easy place to find dinosaurs and fossils in general. There's some places that are famous, like the Ediacara Hills and the Flinders Ranges in South Australia, that were famous for these very famous early soft-bodied impressions, the Ediacara fauna, the first multicellular animals and plants preserved in the fossil record. But... Uh, you know, finding fossils in Australia, you really have to be in a, the right place, and they're mostly very far away from civilization. They're in the middle of the the, the, the outback is usually what the story is. Okay. Contrary to uh, saying, you know, Illinois or Indiana, where I used to teach, where you can go to any outcrop and it's full of fossils. You know, they're mostly crinoids and brachiopods, but they're fossils. This right here, I think, is a really good question. Um, what else in paleontology besides dinosaurs, since they get most of the attention, do you find interesting? Well, I'm a mammal paleontologist, so I would think that's more interesting by far. Uh, I mean, I do dinosaurs because I have to, but I don't do research in dinosaurs in the direct sense. I'm mostly focused on fossil mammals, and I, I mentioned a bunch of different ideas and things we've done with fossil mammals. Uh, as I said, with the Librarian Tarpets mammals, there's tons of cool stuff you can do with the enormous collections and millions of fossils they have. And I've had students work on a bunch of things. I mentioned the saber-toothed kittens. I mentioned how they do not change the climate. Um, those are things I've done with my students over the past few decades. Uh, but I've worked on Badlands mammals. Uh, most of my research has been to focus on one group at a time. And so I, I love fossil rhinos. I worked on them for 25 years until I published this giant book on them. And North American fossil rhinos, they call it the Prothero Rhino Bible now. And so if you ever want to identify any American rhino, you just go to that book and the pictures are there. Uh, and then I worked on a lot of other groups of mammals for a while. I'm currently, we're currently working on peccaries or javelinas which contrary to most people think is not pigs. Peccaries and pigs are only distantly related. They have nothing much in common except they call the same ecology. And I'm currently uh, describing a bunch of new species of peccaries one at a time. Uh, I'm hoping before I die to work on North American camels because there's an entire floor of unstudied North American camel fossils in the American Museum of New York where I was trained. And no one else on the planet has worked on them but me. So I'm hoping to finally get to do that if I ever get the time. Wow. So I, I would say mammals are more than dinosaurs, but not many there's people a, would agree uh, with me. There's a uh, one of uh, we've had this guest on um, several. Um, actually, he's been on two times, I think. Um, but uh, Attila the one, he is uh, studying paleontology um, now, and he says, "Doctor, uh, what are your favorite fossil taxa? Glad to see you on the show. Rhinoceros Giants is one of my favorite books." Oh, good. Well, uh, the first one I ever described and worked on was Subarachidon. That's the first rhino I worked on in graduate school. Uh, that's one of the most common Badlands rhinos, and I've worked on thousands of those. Um, it's hard to say. I mean, yes, uh, Paraceratherium, the rhinoceros giant that I described in that book, uh, even though I've never actually published uh, the, the original research on it, that was done a long time ago. It was a very interesting animal to write a whole book about, you know, one genus of uh, fossil rhino, a whole book about it. Um, and, you know, I've I've had a chance lately, as I said, with these fossil peccaries to, uh, you know, they're almost all new species and sometimes new genera as well. So I've had the great pleasure of being able to name a bunch of them after colleagues of mine because someone's got to name them. If they're brand new, I get that privilege. And I've had someone name a peccary after me. It's called Prothrohyus, and it's found in Texas. Uh, it used to be in the wrong genus, and now they've created a genus for it, and some other colleagues did it for me. And then I got to name a peccary after a friend of mine who named a rhino after me. So there's a rhino called Zysanaminodon prothroi. It's named after me. It's up in the John Day Beds of Oregon. 
And then I returned the favor to Spencer Lucas, who did it by giving naming a, a, a peccary, a Lucas Hyas. So he has his own peccary genus now. Now that's that's one of the rules of zoology, by the way. You cannot name a, a fossil or an organism after yourself, but you can name it after someone else, and then they can scratch your back. We need an I, uh, or, uh, dinosaur. I want to congratulate Pardon? Kyle for having someone say peccary that often, and you weren't giggling at all. I I, I know we I know we don't find them laughable. They're really cool animals. Yep. <laughs> anyway, I know when to be mature. Um, okay, uh, I got. I think I got two more questions. Um, here, actually, these are just com these two are just comments. Um, Bram says, for those arguing against evolution, just provide your evidence. The onus is on you because evolution explains the evidence better than anything else. Right. Thank you for the super chat. Right. Uh, Burden Kent approved. Burden approved. We're all on the creationists now. Uh, Kent Hoven CPA says, um, Tyreek Hill is so fast he he's his own Wi-Fi. Thank you, Kent Hoven CPA. Um, <laughs> Phil, That's not much <laughs> like a conversation we need to have. But. Philip Fide says, I yeah, really enjoy ahead. what you and your team provide. So thank you very much for those super chats. Um, we really do appreciate them. Um, Shannon, I saw that you uh, – oh, here we go. What is the most clear evidence for reptile to mammal transitions? And that will be the uh, the last question that we, we have. Okay. Uh, you can go to certain museums like the American Museum in New York, and they have a display there where you can see all the stages – of uh, things that most people would call reptiles, all including things like Dimetrodon, which has the big fin back on its, uh, on its back and has yet yeah, it has mammal-like features already in its skull. And then you'll see other things that are more advanced and more mammal-like right next to it in various parts of that same hall. And then right around the corner from them, you'll see actual mammals. And you can see all the things happening that, that make reptiles into mammals. The transition from a, a simple jaw that just has one kind of tooth on it a uh, simple conical tooth like all reptiles have to a food jaw that has a complete set of molars and premolars and incisors and canines, which mammals have, uh, a jaw that's made out of one bone, the dentary, like you and I have, as opposed to what Dimetrodon has, which is many different bones, including a dentary, and all those other non-dentary bones are gradually pushed out of the jaw as the jaw becomes all dentary. And two of them are right now being used in your ear. Uh, the incus and malleus, the hammer and the anvil year used to be the quadrate and the articular bone of the jaw of the reptile. And they're still now serving a, their secondary function, which is for hearing, because that's what they do in reptiles. Um, and then the skeleton in general uh, you know, does all sorts of stuff to make it look more mammalian. The limbs stop sprawling. They go underneath the body, so the posture is vertical. You see that in things like lycanops and some of the other fossils on that display. Uh, it, it's a whole list of things. In my evolution book, I have a series of figures that show every one of these characteristics and how they transition. And it's what's so beautiful about it is that no single one fossil is required to do the job, that you see all these various steps at different stages along the way. When I used to teach at Occidental College, I had a really extraordinary set of specimens that I could do this with. I had them look at the skulls of very primitive reptiles, and Dimetrodon, of uh, Thernaxodon, a few other things, and then a mammal like an opossum, and look at each one of these character states. And some of them happen early in you know, the evolution of mammals, some happen just before you become a mammal. And so it shows how this uh, mosaic evolution happens in little stages, and some things happen early, some things happen late. They all happen at once. And um, I, I, I lied. There's one more question. I, somebody was watching earlier but had to dip out, and they wanted to ask you about um, – the glacial lake Missoula. I'm not sure what they meant by that, but I yep. told them that. I what did they want to ask about it? Did they say anything about what they wanted to know? They they wanted to know. Well, glacial lake Missoula, as the name applies, Missoula, Montana, Western Montana, and all that area, Western Montana, was filled at various times during the last ice age with this big glacial lake. So there would be a, a big glacial ice dam where Lake Coeur d'Alene is on the Panhandle of Idaho, and it would block the meltwater from these glaciers and form big lakes that uh, fill the valleys of all of western Montana. And why that's famous is because every once in a while that ice dam would melt back and break, and then it released this big flood of meltwater all over western and eastern Washington mostly, in a place called the Channel Scablands. It's been famous since the 1920s. It's a place where all the soft glacial soils have been scoured away by this enormous amount of water released from these glacial lakes and left uh, these bare rock that was scoured by floodwaters. It's all basically all these old 50-million-year-old lava flows that cover most of that part of the state. And so the Scablands are famous because this is a place where one man, John J. Harlan Bretz, back in the 1920s, recognized that this represented an extraordinary event 
Uh, it was a flood, but it was a natural flood. It's just on the less large scale than anyone ever seen. And during his lifetime, almost no one believed him because they believed that large floods were only supernatural things that dated back to Noah. And nobody could uh, admit those things happened in the real world. And then Brett's was finally vindicated in the 1950s when the first aerial photographs were taken over the region. And they were able to find ripple marks that were the size of buildings. And so that proved that, in fact, enormous volumes of water had flushed across that area. But it doesn't by any means have anything to do with Noah's flood because uh, there's no connection with that Noah's flood at all. And uh, there's one follow-up on the, the question before that. Um, Shannon wanted to know about the uh, – she says she's, she's cloudy on the, the transition from cold blood to warm blood and how that would work. Well, it's complicated because it happens multiple times. Uh, we know it happened, of course, in birds from some group of reptiles. The question is where. There's a big debate about how it happens in dinosaurs, so whether all dinosaurs were warm-blooded or just the small ones. Uh, there's some arguments on that both sides. It requires a series of physiological changes, but uh, the, the, the animals do it differently. So dinosaurs, for example, probably don't develop a four-chambered heart like ours. They probably had a three-chambered heart like an alligator or a crocodile, but they have other adaptations that allow them to to ventilate their bodies, uh, like these big air chambers all through bodies that birds have as well. Mammals do it differently. Mammals do it by uh, developing this very complicated circulatory system that that's, uh, separates the, the blood uh, from the four chambers of the heart. So the, the car blood coming from the lungs goes to one path and comes back to the heart and then becomes the blood going to the rest of the body and, and vice versa. That's unique to mammals. It doesn't happen in birds the same way. And so it's a complicated story. It's hard to summarize in a short thing, but it involves many different kinds of anatomical changes. And we can see much of it if it's preserved in bones, but most of it's not. Well, I can safely say that you are a, um, a smashing hit. Everybody is already uh, well, planning you. your return. They are, uh, they are loving you in the live chat. So I want to thank you so much for, uh, for coming on. And Paul, thank it's you. always a pleasure to, um, to have you. Is Any last uh, parting words, Paul, that, um, that you want to, out there plug anything that you got coming up and then we'll go oh, to all them. i would say is if you're if you're in the live chat and this is a if some of the stuff we talked about with creationists versus evolution uh, if some of that is confusing to you i've traveled the same path uh, and check out my channel to just look at each of these isolated things one video at a time to at least try and make sense of it whether or not it, uh, what the theology is doesn't matter um but we should try and make sense of some of these issues so apologia if you're looking for more of these topics and Doctor, anything that you want to plug, put out there? Yeah, I might as well plug my own work too. Um, if you're interested in uh, my approach to evolution, uh, as some of you may know, I have a book that's now in second edition, a re uh, second edition published in 2013 called Evolution, What the Fossils Say and Why It Matters. And it's uh, much more than just paleontology, although I talk about all the examples we talked about in this, in this program. It's in greater length and with better illustrations. Uh, there's an extensive discussion of the background of creationism and where it came from and the background of the Bible, which I learned when I was a student and learned to read the Bible in Greek and Hebrew. Uh, you know, it opens your eyes when you actually read the Bible in the original. And uh, so a lot of that stuff is not found in most books that deal with creation evolution. So I put all that in there deliberately. And a lot of people have found that very useful in understanding the problem. My current book that's out right now is called When Humans Nearly Vanished. And just came out of Smithsonian Books about a month and a half ago. And it's about a giant explosion of the Toba volcano in Sumatra 73,000 years ago that nearly wiped the humans off the planet. And so if you're interested in that topic, that's out now from Smithsonian. I'm sure you can find it on Amazon. Just look on my, uh, my webpage on Amazon. You'll find all the links. And we'll link that um, in the description of this video as well. Um, and I'm telling you, we've had some, some popular guests on here, but I don't think I've ever seen as much of an outpouring of, uh, of love as you're getting in this live chat right now. So, um, We're good. good. Excellent show. Um, Steve, anything you want to okay. uh, close out with before we say goodbye? You're muted. Oh, sorry, Steve. <laughs> oh, sorry about that. Um, I, I can't keep up with the live chat because it's just been constantly going, and so I haven't really been able to really type anything. But ninety percent of it is Shannon Q, by the way. But uh, no, it, it's just a lot of people having this. They they love when we have an expert come on and be able to access with them, uh, because as Apologia points out, a lot of people are going through these things and they read uh, the creationist literature. They're not actually exposed to the actual facts very often. They actually have to be kind of prompted to go watch somebody's video. And so when we have an expert right. of your caliber come in and they can kind of address some of these things and kind of explain to them these things, 
it may not initially convince them, but I got to tell you, it does spark something with them many times. And a lot of them go, you know what? Maybe I should go check into this and maybe I should uh, reevaluate my position. So it, it has a huge effect. I can assure you, we, we all here can testify that we've had numerous people contact us and say, we, you know what? We've changed our position on something or, you know, we're no longer a uh, flat earther. We are no longer a young earth creationist. And, and when you get those kind oh, of things, great. Uh, right. You know, it makes it makes these the all these shows that we do just ten thousand more times uh, amazing. Yeah, so I do appreciate hear. you coming in and talking about this stuff. Yeah, well, it's uh, great. Uh, as I said, you know, videos videos are a good first step, and if you need more detail, I have a book on the topic. So, absolutely. Speaking of which, um, on the the thirteenth of uh, yeah, the thirteenth of January, we will be having a former uh, flat earther named Sean G. Uh, recently left that behind we will be talking with him and what finally convinced him that the earth was See? in fact round um what i wrote a chapter See? about that just two it days ago happen. yeah <laughs> yep. um so uh i want to thank all of you guys for uh, for tuning in uh, this was a absolute pleasure i loved it it's one of my favorite uh, this is going on the best of non-sequitur playlist for sure so you can check that out all of the links to um his work and to Apologia's channel as well will be in the description down below. You can click that, uh, get the books and whatever uh, else that you uh, you desire. And we will see you back here tomorrow at 4 p.m. where the, the times change, so be aware of that. Tomorrow at 4 p.m. where we will have uh, Christy Winters, who is a uh, very prominent feminist, and she will be talking to uh, Sergey, who owns incels.me, which is a um, – if, if you haven't heard of incels – Google it and study up <laughs> because tomorrow is going to be uh, tomorrow is going to be quite the show. So that's going to be at four p.m. There, yep. there will be a yep. there will be a test tomorrow. That's for sure. Yep. Um, just yeah. just brace yourselves. Just brace yourselves. Yep. Um, and we'll see you tomorrow. Non sequitur. Your facts are uncoordinated.